Hey all here OS Reviews, Melee is back with a new mini PC and today we're going to check it out here, it's the Cyber X1. Just like their quieter line that we've seen previously, it continues to be a fanless mini PC, it can be mounted behind a monitor and kind of disappears from view, but what makes the Cyber X1 a little more unique is the design on the very top as part of the heatsink mechanical design instead of having an active fan. As you can see it's filled with these divots, kind of reminds me of a sci-fi product, almost like a computer of the future, perhaps reminiscent of some nail which are sticking up that gives it a bit more of a horror vibe but we'll take a closer look at the design and also test out whether the performance in terms of thermal dissipation makes sense later in this video. Some additional packaging contents inside include a VESA mount adapter as well as a USB type C AC adapter which is rated for 12 volt 2 amps. Now as for specs, the version here as configured includes 16GB of RAM, 512GB of SSD, and the processor here is the Intel N150. It's a relatively entry level chip that is more known for power efficiency that we have seen in some of their previous quieter and overclock 4C series of mini PCs, so still using that same chip just with a different chassis or shell. You can connect to three external monitors up to 4K 60Hz, and despite being a very compact and thin mini PC, you also have an M2 SSD. SSD slot, which is user expandable. That's pretty cool. We'll see that in a moment. Some other top line specs. This model retails for around $250 on Amazon, though I have seen some coupons available that can slightly bring down the cost a little bit more, perhaps in the holiday shopping season. So we are still talking about an entry level mini PC here with their normal quieter version that has the same processor selling for around 200. So you are paying maybe around 50 bucks more for that slightly newer chassis. And like most mini PCs that you purchase off the shelf, it comes with Windows 11 pre-installed. So this is an eight watt processor here. It's a quad core chip with four threads, turbos up to 3.6 gigahertz, and notably they are using DDR5 RAM, which should be a little faster than some of the DDR4 models that we've seen a year or two back, with a couple of other configuration tiers available. There's a slightly less expensive 8 gigabyte of RAM version as well, with instead 256 gigabytes of SSD, so in half. But be cautious that the most entry-level version, which has only 128 gigabytes of storage, is instead using an eMMC, which is going to give you slower read and write speeds versus the faster SSD speeds that you get in the 256 and 512 gigabyte versions. Other standard connectivity include Wi-Fi 5, Bluetooth 5.1, as well as USB 3.2 Gen 2 speeds, and since it is a standard Intel x86 processor, you can of course install other operating systems, including Ubuntu, Linux, if you choose to do so. Very lightweight though at only 288 grams, and again it's all about that higher thermal conductivity as part of the engineering on the very top that claims to achieve better performance over extended loads if you are running it for longer it's not going to thermal throttle compared to other fanless mini PCs. Now the build quality is actually surprisingly robust. The back as well as frame are constructed out of aluminum alloy so it has a metal build compared to plastic which is what we usually see at this price point. Very bottom here features the VESA mount as well as the four screws which can be removed pretty easily using a standard screwdriver to gain access to the aforementioned compartments for expanding on the M2 SSD. You can see some thermal tape there since the, again, lid parts, the bottom base are made of metal, protecting it from direct contact while providing some additional cooling properties. So pretty simple but effective design. Soft touch rubber feet at the bottom also prevents it from sliding around on a surface or desk. There's just a simple power key on the front and then located on the right hand edge you'll find three USB type A ports. Uh, two of these are going to be faster USB 3.2 speeds versus one which is slightly slower USB 2.0. You also have a Kingsington lock. And then on the back you find access to a full spec type C port for display output as well as data transfer, micro SD card slot as well as the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, two more full size HDMI ports, and another type C which is designed for only power at 12 volts, so for the AC adapter only, not for data transfer. There's also a ethernet port for wired internet connectivity. Here it is next to a aforementioned quieter line device, so you can see that the chassis size in terms of width hasn't really changed, it's just a little bit taller to accommodate those spikes for the enhanced passive cooling. Again, in terms of the aesthetic, I would say that I personally do think it looks kind of cool as a fan of sci-fi and kind of mecha-inspired tech, but on the other hand, I can understand if some folks think that it looks a little bit scary. It's not as bad as something like the Light L16 camera that we discussed a while back. This was the quote-unquote camera of the future that failed. It has 16 camera lenses, which can seem like a nightmare for folks that have a fear of holes randomly scattered on the surface, almost like a 
spider's eye as it blinks and tries to capture more detail using a combination of these lenses through computational photography. However, the results just never really lived up to the hype. Uh, in comparison, this is at least more orderly grids running across it. But yeah, pessimists would say it's giving me those vibes in a way. Similarly, another practical consideration is even though you have enhanced surface area because of all the grooves and divots going on uh, for heat to dissipate, if you decided to unfold this entire surface, aka flattening it out like a pancake, it would probably stretch a larger surface, which is why it's a little more effective. However, because there's more grooves and crevices, you have to think about perhaps there's a bit more dust or lint that can collect on the inside, and so for cleaning purposes, it would definitely be recommended to use something like compressed air or a fan to blow through it, uh, or another alternative is using some of the slime or kind of Play-Doh-like materials that we've also seen that you can press inside to extract any dust for cleaning, so just keep that in mind. But yeah, an interesting look for sure. Here it is next to kind of a typical size smartphone, having around a 6.5 inch screen you can see next to it. It is actually around the same size, give and take. Kind of impressive, considering this is a full-blown Windows computer at the end of the day. So very compact, especially compared to some of the models that do have a active cooling fan. It looks something like this, a more traditional box, and you can tell that next to it, the CyberX, despite being a little bit thicker already due to those spikes, is already substantially lighter and more compact across almost all of its dimensions. If you need a completely silent computer, you don't want to hear any fan noise at all, consuming even less power, those are some potential benefits of a system like this. Now by the way, the info card as part of the user guide is also kind of interesting because it tells us the rated average temperatures, which we will also measure in our own testing in a moment. But it's saying that the surface can reach around 55 to 70 degrees Celsius, will definitely get a little bit warmer of course, like most fanless mini PCs, to dissipate the heat. A full low test maxing out the RAM reaches 70 degrees versus if you're just doing online video playback and streaming, it reaches around 65 degrees versus local playback of some files stored on the computer's memory can get you around 55 degrees similar to office tasks. So as you use it with more intensive applications, the temperature will also rise a little bit more. A cold boot into Windows only takes around 20 seconds, relatively quick. Although like other budget solid run computers, I have found that after you get in, you have to wait for maybe about a minute or so for the machine to completely wake up, all the processes to initialize before it then starts to run a bit more smoothly. So give it just an extra second or so. And afterwards, all the transition effects are actually handled better than I expected, to be honest, considering that Windows 11 is quite heavy, definitely quite usable when it comes to overall navigation. And quickly verifying the system specs, we can see it does have the aforementioned N150 with 16 gigabytes of RAM. There's no other bloatware on here aside from the standard Microsoft Apps utility functions, 434 gigs free after the operating system. Now jumping into the Edge browser here, we can start off with a quick look at synthetic benchmarks. As we talked about previously, these aren't always going to be a direct match with real world performance, but still gives us a rough idea of how it's stacking up. In this case, it has a pass mark score of around 5,400 on multi-thread, close to around 2,000 on single thread. Again, it's a quad-core processor, which is incredibly energy efficient, only 6 watts for the typical TDP. And just for reference, some of the i7s and i9 Intel devices draws close to around 45 watts that we've seen recently. And compared to a couple of other chips, including the N95, you can see that it's a touch stronger, but not a dramatic difference. Still is, again, quad-core chipset around the 5000 range for pass mark. And really, the same thing can be said about the slightly older N100 as well. However, this is a significant improvement compared to earlier processors found in the $200 range of mini PCs, including the Sauron N3450, for example, was incredibly popular just a few years back, but had a lower max clock speed and instead only reached around 2,000 points on pass market. So by contrast, this is already almost two times more performant versus some of the previous Celeron-based chips. And so even though it's definitely entry-level still by 2025 standards, comparing it to other mid-range and flagship chips coming out in the same time, if you're instead comparing it with slightly older generation processors, again, we are seeing some of those incremental gains even on some of the entry-level chipsets. A couple of other chips here for reference, including an Apple M1 octa-core processor, scores closer to 14,000 on Passmark, 
So this is roughly a third of that. Again, older generation of Intel Core i3s, Core M3s, surprisingly, they actually get quite close in terms of uh, performance and benchmarks these days. So the takeaway is this is not a bad score, in my opinion, for a 2025 entry-level processor, especially considering that it's a completely silent, fanless machine. Again, this version with 16 gigs of RAM, I was able to open up around a dozen tabs in the browser, and I was still able to retain the previous tabs in the memory without too many problems. So honestly, for casual computing tasks when it comes to doing research, uh, web browsing, it shouldn't be that problematic. Here's CNET, which is another slightly heavier page, plenty of videos and ads on here as we scroll down, some of the images maybe taking a split second instead of being instantaneous like on true flagships, but all in all it's still a very usable experience I have to say. The overall internet reception strength using the Wi-Fi has also been quite good. Again, the chassis of these Mealy quieter line has always been a bit more compact, and so the components are jammed in a little bit more. But broadly speaking, staying connected wasn't too problematic. Now, pulling up the task manager over here, currently I have quite a few heavier tabs open in the browser, including a few 4K videos that will start to play back in a moment as demonstration. And so the CPU is also getting a little bit higher as well, but still seems to run okay, at least during normal operation. If it's installing Windows updates behind the scenes, it might hang up a little bit more, but still seems to be generally responsive enough. Something interesting that I observed is when you actually go through Windows setup, it doesn't require you to sign into your Microsoft account initially. In fact, even connecting to internet, including Wi-Fi, is actually bypassed during the initial setup flow, allowing you to sign in and connect to internet yourself later on. Maybe that speeds up the initial setup, but it is a little bit different from the typical flow that I wanted to flag. Now, just like with web browsing, it's no surprise that even on entry-level computers, you're able to run casual office tasks, including Excel, uh, PowerPoint, as well as Word documents. Now, again, like most computers in this generation, Microsoft is really no longer providing you with a lifetime copy of Office when you purchase one of these entry-level computers like they did in the 2010s, for example. So just keep that in mind. On some devices, you may find a 30-day free trial of 365 that allows you to also edit the document offline. But regardless, when it comes to running these office-related tasks, didn't have too many problems, even for slightly more complex spreadsheets as well. Now let's also play back a quick YouTube video. We can crank it up up to 4K resolution, also pulling up stats for nerds. Pop over here to full screen. You can see it takes maybe a split second there to initially snap into focus. Uh, we can also jump into a different part of the video. And what's quite impressive is we are seeing very minimal drop frames, as you can see here on the top, even though we are scrubbing between uh, different parts of the video as it continues to play back. So yes, for video streaming, whether it's YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, this is also going to be a pretty good application as an entertainment device. Uh, no real complaints for the most part. Again, maybe just a split second for it to initially load, but once it does play back, it remains pretty smooth, all things considered including local files that you may have stored on the device's SSD, streaming as well, both doing a pretty decent job, as you can see. Maybe one or two drop frames in a longer video clip, but all seems to be doing pretty reasonable. And now briefly checking on the temperature using a thermal camera here, we can see that the top portion of the machine uh, under slightly heavier loads, that is playing back 4K videos with a couple other tabs in the browser, some office documents open, kind of maxing out the CPU as you saw there for around 15 to 20 minutes. Looks like the top of the chassis, the spiky region, reaches around 127 degrees Fahrenheit and the bottom portion here being a little bit cooler uh, by around 10 to 15 degrees. In fact, the very bottom portion here is a little closer around 75 degrees when I measured it earlier. So overall, I would say they've definitely left the top material here to do the most work when it comes to dissipating heat, and the increased surface area because of the divots and bumps on here do seem to be doing a pretty effective job. And indeed, compared to the previous flat design of the chassis, I would say on average I'm noticing maybe around a 15 degree Fahrenheit difference. Um, that is, this one seems to be a little bit more effective at dissipating the heat a little bit more quickly, whereas the previous design felt a little bit warmer to the touch and also took longer to cool down. Uh, and so when you are kind of running programs which are heavier for longer durations, for instance, using it as a media streaming device in Ultra HD and maybe running it for hours and hours on end, 
you'll be able to enjoy slightly better sustained performance over the long run. And similarly, when it comes to doing heavier tasks like some gaming, again, being able to keep a slightly higher frame rate or FPS before it starts dipping, especially on retro emulation titles, it actually maintains a pretty fast and playable frame rate, as you can see here. So some of these titles can definitely be enjoyed locally if you're doing some very light casual gaming. However, if you're looking at more AAA style titles, definitely would recommend use cloud gaming instead. As expected for a silent, fanless mini PC, see that's more about efficiency at the end of the day. So if you are into more serious gaming, it would probably be better to look at a higher end model, primarily in the GPU department, compared to installing and running the game locally, in which case you would probably want to stick with slightly older retro emulation titles or keep it onto some of the lower graphic settings. And really that transfers over to light video editing and photo editing as well. I mean, yes, it is possible to do a little bit of work here and there, but you have to wait slightly longer for the videos to completely render. For example, a one minute long 1080p or full HD resolution video took me around two minutes to fully export. And compared to 4K resolution, that same one minute length took closer to around four minutes, four and a half minutes to export. So just keep in mind, the longer that you go from there and the more elements you add into your timeline might further increase the processing time. So not quite as fast, but if you are doing something very light, like just stitching a couple of quick clips together, as well as just some basic touch-ups in Photoshop, it can still get you by. I would say, as long as you have those expectations tempered. But of course, one of the benefits of a full-blown Windows desktop computer is you have tons of compatibility when it comes to legacy software and apps, uh, including some ones here which are a bit more optimized for entertainment from the Microsoft Store, in addition to all of the legacy drivers, executables using the standard Intel x86 chip. So there we have it. That's been a quick look at the Mealy Cyber series. And again, just introduces a new chassis design, which seems to be doing a decent job at just keeping the thermals running a bit more consistently over longer durations. It's a little more effective at dissipating heat more quickly and preventing the bottom base of the computer from also getting heated up quite as much, perhaps improving on the longevity of the system components if you're using it for years and years to come. And because it's, again, a bit more effective at regulating temperature by around 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take, compared to a normal Mealy Quieter mini PC. When you are pressing it a little bit more for things like longer sessions of video streaming, light gameplay, things like that, especially if you're using it in the summertime, places like Florida, for example, or in Southeast Asia, uh, then definitely this difference might be a little bit more significant. More instances of thermal buildup and possible thermal throttling as a result, in which case the performance dips because it tries to lower the clock speed to prevent itself from getting overheated. But on here, it's just able to sustain itself a little bit more. Again, we are testing this currently though towards the winter time here in the Western Hemisphere, and it's relatively cold, so it's in a really great natural environment at this point in time, but even so, I would say it is making a slight difference, maybe just a little bit shy of the 20 degrees Celsius uh, that was advertised on the product page under ideal circumstances, but even looking past those quantitative numbers, qualitatively just picking up the computer with my hands, it definitely feels a little bit cooler to the touch. It's no longer as scorching. I mean, yes, it still is warm, trying to dissipate it using the material, but on the previous generation models with a more flat design, it was almost uncomfortable to even touch with a finger, and that is how hot it got with the thermally conductive metal lid. And can also confirm that using it for a couple of hours, in addition to even installing updates behind the scenes, the performance has been surprisingly quite stable and consistent, which wasn't always the case on previous models of fanless mini PCs. So yeah, pretty good in terms of consistency, web browsing, office-related tasks really is where a machine like this will shine, using it for some entertainment streaming, then I think this is still an excellent option to consider. You can check out more details if you're interested in links down below. It'll also be interesting to track where Mealy goes from this point. I'm curious whether they could combine a chassis like this, which is great at dissipating heat, perhaps with a small fan, and use a even more performant chip designed for power users. That might be kind of interesting as more of a flagship great device. But anyways, if you're in the market more for an entry-level budget mini PC, Mealy continues to offer plenty of options. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That has been the Mealy Cyber Fanless Mini PC.